Hello everyone. So today we are going to discuss the histology of pituitary gland. Now I'm going to do this video in a different way. First we will talk about the slide itself and identify the structures that are present within the slide and then we are going to extend this video into the theory part. So those of, those of you who are interested in only knowing the structures that are seen under the microscope then they can uh, finish the video after the slide is over and if you want to know more about the theory bit then you can stay on and we will have a good discussion about the theory portion of the histology of pituitary gland. Now let's dig into the pituitary gland itself. So this is a picture that has been taken from Ross's histology and this is what one can expect to see under the microscope. So this is the anterior portion and this is the post posterior portion. Pars distalis and pars nervosa are respectively parts of the anterior and the posterior pituitary. In between these two portions, there is this pars intermedia, which is considered as a part of the anterior pituitary gland. Now, if we magnify this structure further under the light microscope, say about 10 times magnification, then we get a picture like this. I know uh, in this portion, it's not very easy to visualize the colored and the non-colored cells. So I'll just zoom into this photomicrograph and now we have a better idea of the cells that are not taking up the colors and the cells that are actually taking up the colors. So here is a cell that is not taking up any color and here are cells that are taking up colors. This one is taking up the red color and this is taking up the blue color. So the cells which are not taking up any colors are called chromophobe cells and the cells which are taking up colors are called chromophil cells. In the chromophil cells, they are further divided into the acidophils and basophils. The acidophils will take up the pink color and the basophils will take up the blue colors. Now why some cells are taking up the colors while the others are not taking up the colors? This is because of the presence of granules in the cytoplasm of the cells. The chromophore cells do not have any granules or even if they do, they are very small and very minute numbers of granules that are present within the cytoplasm of the chromophobes. On the other hand, the chromophil cells, that is the acidophils and basophils, they have got lots of granules in their cytoplasm and they take up the color. If the granules in the cytoplasm take up the pink color, then they are called the acidophils and if the granules within the cytoplasm take up the blue color, then they are called the basophils and hence the difference in the colors of the chromophil cells. Now what about the chromophobe cells? What exactly are the chromophobe cells? Now the chromophobe cells are said to be either cells that are not mature enough to develop granules within them and hence they are not taking up the colors or they are exhausted chromophil cells who have completely exhausted their granules and they are now without any granules. So that is why they are not taking up the colors. So this is some say the, these are two different cells uh, and some say that the chromophobe and chromophil cells have got a cycle uh, by which the chromophobes become chromophil and then after exhaustion of the granules the chromophils again become chromophobes. So there are a lot of theories about this but uh, so far as the slide goes the cells that do not have any granules and not taking up any colors are called chromophobes and the ones that are taking up the colors and have granules they are called chromophils. If they are taking up pink color, they are called acidophils and if they are taking up blue color, they are called basophils. Now the acidophils and the basophils are further divided. The acidophils can be mammotrophs or somatotrophs and the basophils can be either thyrotrophs, gonadotrophs or corticotrophs. So these are different names given to the cells depending upon the kind of secretions that they have. A mammotroph will secrete prolactin and a somatotroph will secrete somatotrophin or growth hormone. A thyrotroph will secrete TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. A corticotroph will secrete ACTH and a gonadotroph will secrete FSH and LH that is follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So depending upon the different secretions, these cells are given these different names. Now let us take this photomicrograph into consideration. This is a very nicely taken photomicrograph. It has got a lot of details of the cells that are present within it. First things that we can see is this cluster of cells. You can see this is a big cluster of cells with 
different kinds of cells in it we can have chromo we have chromophobes here we have red colored acidophils and we have got blue colored basophils so this cluster of cell is clumped together and surrounding this cluster of cells are the capillaries one two three four why the capillaries are here first of all it has to get blood supply so the capillaries are there and second is that this is an endocrine gland pituitary is an endocrine gland that means it secretes hormone and it does not have any ducts so all the secretions that are being produced by the acidophils and basophils they are directly going into the capillaries and through the bloodstream these capillaries will carry these hormones to their target organs which are far away from the site of production in this case pituitary gland so a TSH which has been secreted by the thyrotrophs will get poured into the capillaries and they will go and reach the thyroid gland where they will act. So that is why we have got a rich supply of capillaries surrounding the cluster of cells. Here if we zoom in a little bit we can find the RBCs present within the capillaries. These are single uh, cell endothelial cells are there that are lining the capillaries and this cluster of cells has got chromophobe cells, basophils and acidophils. Now this is all about the anterior pituitary. Pars nervosa is a major component of the posterior pituitary. The pars nervosa does not have any secretory cells. The name itself suggests pars nervosa. It mainly contains nerve fibers or rather the terminal portions of the axons of the neurons whose cell bodies are present in the hypothalamus, namely the supraoptic and the paraventricular nuclei. So this portion will contain the terminal axon portion of these neurons and sub surrounding them will be the pituicides. These pituicides are nothing but glial cells whose function is similar to the astrocytes. So the pituicides will consist of 25% of the total volume of the pars nervosa. So they are mainly in the supporting role. So here we have got pars nervosa. So here we have got the pars nervosa. Now we can immediately see how different it looks from the pars distalis. Pars distalis had clusters of cells surrounded by capillaries. That is because they're synthesizing and secreting the hormones that needed to be poured into the bloodstream. Here we have mainly cells and these special structures which are called the herring bodies. These herring bodies are nothing but the fascicles that are present in the terminal portions of the axons of the neurons whose cell bodies are present in the supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei of the hypothalamus. So these fascicles they contain hormones, hormones like vasopressin and oxytocin. So technically speaking, the posterior pituitary does not secrete or rather does not synthesize any hormone, but it releases the hormones that are present within the vesicles of the terminal portions of the axons of neurons whose cell bodies are present in the hypothalamus. And these cell bodies of the neurons, they are producing this vasopressin and oxytocin. And posterior pituitary only stores this in there in the vesicles, the herring bodies, and depending upon the instruction receipt, they release the hormones, vasopressin and oxytocin, into the bloodstream. So they have also got capillaries. So here is one capillary, here is another capillary. So this posterior pituitary will also have a lot of capillaries. Here also, this is a different kind of stain. Here also we can appreciate the herring bodies. This is one herring body, this is another herring body, this is another herring body. And if we zoom, we can see the capillaries here with the RBCs in it. Okay. And then we have got the pituicides. This bluish colored dots, these are the nuclei of the pituicides, which are the supporting cells. So this is another capillary here. This is These are the capillaries with RBCs within it. And this is an enlarged picture of this fascicle that contains the hormones and are called the herring bodies. So HB stands for herring bodies. So these are the dilated terminal portions of the axons. So these are the herring bodies. In between the anterior and the posterior pituitary, we have another part which is called the pars intermedia. This one. This portion is called the pars intermedia. So this is a 
technically this is a part of the anterior pituitary but it lies between the pars distalis the secretory portion of the pituitary gland and the pars nervosa the posterior portion of the pituitary gland and this is the remnant of the Rathke's pouch now what is the Rathke's pouch Rathke's pouch is the origin of the anterior pituitary so it is the ectoderm lining the oropharynx and this oropharyngeal ectoderm it goes up and it forms or, or rather it develops into the anterior pituitary we'll discuss that when we talk about the theory portion of the pituitary histology so this pars intermediate is an enlarged portion of the pars intermedia it contains many cysts you can see these are the cysts this is pars distalis this is pars nervosa so these are the cysts these are called the colloid cyst these are the remnants of the these are the this is a colloid cyst this is a colloid cyst so these are the remnants of the Rothkiss pouch the embryological origin of the anterior pituitary so this is all about the pituitary gland yes one more thing the capillary pituitary gland will have a capsule surrounding it so this is the capsular part and within the capsule we have got the pituitary itself so this is all about the slide of the pituitary gland and the main identification point is the balls of cells where it will contain some cells will have blue color some cells will have pink color and some cells will not be colored there rather they will be colorless and surrounding them will be a lot of capillaries and if you just move the slide then we will get a picture like this where there are no not many cellular components are there mainly there are nerve fibers and pituitary sites are there but they are not very big as that of these cells so then we can identify this as the pituitary gland so this is all about the slide of the pituitary gland now let's continue with the theory of the histology of pituitary gland the pituitary gland is situated underneath the brain so where exactly it is situated this is important because we need to have an idea of where exactly the pituitary is now I have here a skull now I have here a skull and if I just remove this upper portion of the skull then we have the base of the skull so this is the base of the skull this is the anterior part and this is the posterior part so this is where the nose and the eyes and the face is there and this is the back of the head this here the big foramina here is called the foramen magnum so this is the occipital bone and this here is the sphenoid bone in the middle we can see a depression so this depression is called cella thoracica and this is where the pituitary gland resides so this portion will have the brain in it and underneath the brain connected to the hypothalamus we have the pituitary that is resting on this small depression called the cella thoracica so this is where the pituitary is located it has a connection with the hypothalamus and actually the hypothalamus controls the function of pituitary gland so pituitary endocrine gland is under the control of the hypothalamus the pituitary gland is also called the hypophysis and it is also known as the master gland because this gland controls the function of other endocrine glands with the help of its secretions that is the hormones but this gland is itself under the control of the hypothalamus so the hypothalamus is basically controlling everything now the, the pituitary gland if we look closely can be divided into two portions two distinct portions one is called the anterior part and the other one is called the posterior part the anterior part is also known as the adenohypophysis and it consists mainly of the pars distalis that we have already discussed in the slide this is the secretory portion and then along with the pars distalis it has got pars intermedia that pars also got discussed in the slide portion and the pars tuberalis the portion that is surrounding the infundibulum or the stock with which the pituitary is connected to the hypothalamus the posterior pituitary on the other hand consists of pars nervosa which we discussed then infundibulum this is nothing but the stock with which the posterior pituitary and the entire pituitary gland itself is connected to the hypothalamus mainly the posterior pituitary it will be wrong to say the entire pituitary because the posterior pituitary is the portion that is connected to the hypothalamus we will learn about that in a little while and then the median eminence so basically anterior pituitary is producing and secreting hormones and the posterior pituitary is only storing the hormones and 
releasing them. It is not producing any hormones of its own. It does not have any secretory cells on its of its own. Now, why do we have two portions that are so different from one another? And yet, they are the part of the same organ. This is because the anterior and the posterior pituitary have got different embryological origin. Now, let us see the embryology. The anterior pituitary is basically formed from the oropharyngeal ectoderm called the Rathke pouch. And the posterior pituitary is the downward extension of the neuroectoderm of the floor of the third ventricle. So these two structures, one the neuroectoderm and the other one the oropharyngeal ectoderm, they come together and they form the structure. That is why the posterior pituitary has got the infundibulum that is connected to the hypothalamus because basically the posterior pituitary is an extension of the brain itself. So it has got the connection. The anterior pituitary just hangs on to the posterior pituitary in a way. But these two structures are covered by the capsule and they become a single organ but they have got different embryological origin. Anterior pituitary from the Rathke's pouch or the oropharyngeal ectoderm and the posterior pituitary from the neuroectoderm. So that is why we have the posterior pituitary having this infundibulum that continues with the hypothalamus. So that is the origin of the pituitary gland. Now we have already discussed the discussed the slide so I am not going to talk about the slide anymore. So what else do we need to know? Now let's talk about the pars intermedia. We have already talked a little bit about the pars intermedia. It is located between the pars distalis and pars nervosa. It has got colloid cysts that we have already talked. These are the remnants of the Rathke's pouch. It consists mainly of basophils and it is seen that these basophils produce MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone in case of amphibians, frogs. And it is also believed that these cells are also involved in the production of MSH, SCTH and lipotrophic hormones in case of human beings but it's not clear as yet. These are theories. And then we have got the pars tuberilis finally, which is nothing but the portion of the anterior pituitary that wraps itself around the infundibular stalks of the neurohypophysis. So neurohypophysis we have already talked. Regarding the theory, we should know how the hypothalamus is controlling the pituitary gland. Because we have already talked that the hypothalamus, which is the seat of autonomic nervous system, controls all the autonomic activities of the body. Uh, it also will control the endocrine function or endocrine system of the body and it does so by controlling the pituitary gland because we have already told that pituitary gland is called the master gland because it controls other endocrine glands by its secretions and pituitary is being controlled by the hypothalamus so hypothalamus is basically controlling everything via pituitary so what about the hypothalamic control of the pituitary gland now we have got a very simplified diagram over here so this diagram gives a very good idea. But before going deep into the hypothalamic control of the pituitary gland, first we should know about the hypothalamo-hypophysial portal systems. A portal vein will connect one capillary bed to another capillary bed. So here this hypophysial portal vein is connecting this capillary bed around the median eminence and the infundibulum with that of the capillary bed of the hypophysial portal system in the pars distalis. So this is pars distalis and this is pars nervosa. So this capillary bed, this portal veins are connecting this capillary bed and this capillary bed. In hypothalamo hypophysial portal system, superior hypophysial arteries, so these are the superior hypophysial arteries, form a capillary network at the base of the hypothalamus. So we have hypothalamus over here and this is forming a capillary bed in the base of the hypothalamus in the median eminence and in the infundibulum. So this is the median eminence and this is the infundibulum. We know that this is the stock-like structure, the infundibulum. This capillary network is called the primary capillary plexus. So, so the capillary plexus is called the primary capillary plexus. From this plexus, blood drains into the hypophysial portal veins, which are these two. And this blood passes through the infundibulum to the pars distalis this portion. In the anterior pituitary gland, the hypophysial portal vein redivides to form a secondary capillary plexus, this one. So the portal vein connects one capillary bed to the another capillary bed. The neurons of the median eminence, here 
the neurons of the median eminence and the infundibular nuclei are involved in the secretions of the releasing hormones. So these nuclei that are present in this area, they will produce certain hormones that will be coming into the capillary plexus, the primary capillary plexus, and through the portal veins, they will come into the into the pars distalis and they they will have their influence on the on the cells of the pars distalis and thereby the pars distalis will react according to the chemical message received through this portal veins coming from the median eminence and the infundibular nuclei so the basics arrangement of the hypophyseal portal system or the hypothalamo hypophyseal portal system is that the superior hypophyseal artery will break into capillary plexus around the median eminence and the infundibulum. This is called the primary capillary plexus. And from the primary capillary plexus, we will have veins coming to the pars distalis. And these veins are called the hypophyseal veins. And these veins will again divide into a capillary bed. And that capillary bed will be present within the pars distalis. So basically, these veins will be connecting the capillary bed around the median eminence to the capillary bed so present in the pars distalis. Now, with this information in our hands, let us talk about the uh, hypothalamic control of the pituitary gland. So, I have already told you that the hypothalamus is the seat of autonomic nervous system. It will control all the autonomic functions around the body, including the endocrine system. So, the master gland, the pituitary, which is controlling all the other endocrine glands, receives information or instructions from the hypothalamus. Now the hypothalamus contains two kinds of cells, one is, uh, two kinds of neurons. One is called the parvocellular neuron and the other one is called the magnocellular neurons. Now the parvocellular neurons will secrete releasing hormones. So these parvocellular neurons, they will release the or secrete the releasing hormones and these hormones directly come into the primary capillary plexus. From the primary capillary plexus, from the primary capillary plexus, these releasing hormones are taken to the pars distalis via the hypophyseal portal vein, via the hypophyseal portal vein. And these releasing hormones then have their influence on the cells of the anterior pituitary or the pars distalis. What are releasing hormones? They can be TRH, they can be GnRH, gonadotrophin releasing hormone. So these releasing hormones will influence the way the cells produce their secretions. I'll give you an example. If suppose a person is having hypothyroidism. So that person's thyroid gland is not working properly. So it's not producing adequate amount of thyroxine and other thyroid hormones. So the level of T3 and T4 in the bloodstream will be low. And that gets detected in the hypothalamus. So hypothalamus, after having detected low levels of T3 and T4, will release more of TRH, thyrotrophin releasing hormone. This increased amount of TRH will come into the anterior pituitary and it will tell the thyrotrophs to produce more of TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, this increased amount of TSH goes into the bloodstream and then it reaches the thyroid follicles. And there it tells the thyroid follicles to produce more of T3 and T4. That is why if we suspect somebody of having hypothyroidism, then what we do? We ask for blood tests. We ask them to do a thyroid profile, which contains mainly T3, T4 and TSH. So if a person is having normal level of T3 and T4, but an increased amount of TSH, that means the person is having hypothyroidism because thyroid stimulating hormone is more than the normal amount. That means what? That means the normal amount of T3 and T4 that is that has been reflected in the bloodstream or the, in the blood report is because of that increased amount of TSH that is telling the thyroid follicles to produce that amount of T3 and T4. If there was no TSH, then the T3 and T4 will not be adequate. So the increased amount of TSH will indicate that the thyroid is not functioning well and it is a very sensitive marker of hypothyroidism. So if a person is having normal level of T3 and T4 but increased amount of TSH, then we can 
safely say that that person is suffering from hypothyroidism and he may need medication. This, this is how the hypothalamus controls the secretions of the pituitary gland, mainly the anterior pituitary gland. The posterior pituitary on the other hand does not have any such secretory function so it is not being controlled directly with the help of releasing hormones that are coming to the posterior pituitary. So that is how the pituitary gland is controlled by the hypothalamus. This is called the hypothalamic control of the hypophysis or hypothalamic control of the pituitary gland. The posterior pituitary has got axon terminals coming from the neurons situated in the paraventricular and supraoptic nuclei of the hypothalamus and that forms the hypothalamo-hypophysial tract. So that will form the hypothalamo-hypophysial tract and these hypothalamo-hypophysial tract will carry the vasopressin and oxytocin that is being secreted by the magnocellular neurons that are situated in these two nuclei and they will be synthesizing these hormones vasopressin and oxytocin in the cell bodies and then these hormones will come down the axonal terminals and they will be stored in the axonal terminals in the form of fascicles which are called the herring bodies and as and when the need arises the oxytocin and vasopressin gets released into the bloodstream in the or the capillary plexus of the posterior pituitary here and then they go to the target organ to fulfill their function so this is all about the pituitary gland and uh, thank you for your patient listening and i will see you in the next video thank you